Hi, I'm Megan Morrison, an Applied Mathematics PhD student at the University of Washington. Today, I'm going to be talking about preventing memory loss in memory networks using auxiliary devices. This research is published in the Journal of Computational and Mathematical Methods in Medicine. I did this project with Dr. Pedro Amaya from the Weill Cornell School of Medicine and Dr. Nathan Kutz from the Applied Mathematics Department at the University of Washington. Neural networks can be trained to produce a variety of different outputs in response to an input stimulus. This is an example of a force learning network which produces this output function when it's healthy. Networks are susceptible to damage, however, and when this network is damaged, it can no longer produce the desired target output. Damage comes in the form of eliminating connections in the network, which emulates focal axonal swelling. This happens when in response to traumatic brain injury. Um, swelling in axons either block or distort signals traveling down the axon and disrupt communication in the brain. Damage in the brain may be able to be counteracted through brain-machine interfaces, which could take the form of an artificial neural network, a chip, or an organoid. Researchers have been able to grow cerebral organoids from stem cells. This cerebral organoid progressed through the stages of neural development in a matter of days, and the resulting organoid had specialized neurons as well as distinct brain regions um, that were, of course, underdeveloped. The cerebral organoid's further development was limited by the fact that it did not have a vascular system. There are a variety of ways in which we can interface with a biological neural network on both the macro and micro scale. On the micro scale, researchers have been able to grow neural networks on a microelectrode array, which can both stimulate and record from individual neurons. Researchers have also grown neurons on semiconductor chips and integrated them with silicon nanowires. On more than macro scale, researchers have implanted microbioelectrodes into a rat cortex, which would record or stimulate from an entire brain region as opposed to from an individual neuron. In our study, we wanted to take a memory network and simulate damage. We wanted to see how the network performed with the help of an auxiliary device. We used a hot, the Hotfield model, which is an auto-associative memory network. When it is presented with an input stimulus, after multiple iterations, it should be able to retrieve a stored memory. Here are the mathematics behind the Hotfield model. We take a variety of patterns, which will be our stored memories, and turn them into vectors. We then take the vectors, concatenate them together to create the memory collection. We create the connectivity matrix by multiplying the memory collection by its transpose. Each value in the connectivity matrix represents the connectivity weight between one node in the network and another node in the network. The neurons in this model have a binary state. They're either on with a value of positive one or off with a value of negative one. To update the neuron states, we take their current states, multiply them by the connectivity matrix, and this gives us our input stimulus for the next time step. At the next time step, if for an individual neuron, the input stimulus is greater than or equal to zero, the neuron turns on with a value of positive one. If the input stimulus is less than zero, the neuron turns off with a value of negative, negative one. Now all the neuron states have been updated and we can go through this process again. A healthy network should converge to one of the stored 
memory patterns after several iterations. In our simulation, we had an original network as well as an auxiliary network, and they both had stored memories. We created augmented memory patterns by stacking the original memories on top of the auxiliary memories. We created an auxiliary connectivity matrix by, just as before, multiplying the memory collection by its transpose. The augmented connectivity matrix had four sections. A represents connections between neurons in the original network. D represents connections between neurons in the auxiliary network. B and C both represent connections um, between the networks. Here's the process that we went through to train the network. We started off with our original network. We randomly generated sparse connections to the auxiliary network. Next, we presented the network with stimuli, which took the form of the memories. We then recorded what corresponding memories the auxiliary network converged to. We took those recorded memories and we used them to generate the auxiliary um, connectivity matrix. Lastly, we used both sets of memories to generate the connections coming from the auxiliary network back to the original network. Here's what we did in a little bit more detail. We started out with a healthy network, which when we presented it with noisy stimulus, it would converge to a stored pattern. We next connected the auxiliary network. These connections are sparse and random in order to emulate a brain-machine interface, which would connect um, very sparsely with a biological network. Next, we calibrated the auxiliary memories by stimulating the network with the original memory patterns and seeing what corresponding memories the auxiliary um, network generated. We then took all these memories, generated the auxiliary um, connectivity matrix, um, and stored that in our larger matrix. Lastly, we connected the original, the auxiliary network back to the original network. The next stage of our stimulation was damaging the original network and analyzing memory recovery um, when the original network was connected to the auxiliary network. So first we damaged the original network by eliminating connections. Next, we connected the auxiliary network to the original network. When the network is damaged, it can no longer retrieve memories if the damage is large enough. However, when the auxiliary network is connected, it is able to retrieve its corresponding memories because the auxiliary network is not damaged. Once the auxiliary network has retrieved its corresponding memory, we turn on connections back to the original network. And the auxiliary network feeds this information back to the original network. And finally, the original network is able to retrieve its stored memory. Here are the stimulation parameters that we used. We stored 20 memories in the network. Um, the original network size is 1,000 neurons well as the auxiliary network um, had two sizes. We used a 200 neural network and a 400 neural network. Density in C is 5%. We varied the density in B from 0 to 50%, as well as we varied the noise level from 0 to 50%, and we varied the damage level from 0 to 80%. We use two sets of memories. The memories in the green box are the optimal memories. These memories are very orthogonal to each other, and the network is able to retrieve these memories 100% of the time when it's not damaged. The memories in the pink box, however, are, are not as orthogonal to each other, and the network is not able to retrieve these memories always, even when it's healthy. 
here are the results from our um, simulation for the optimal network. On the x-axis, we have noise. On the y-axis, we have connectivity back to the original network. And the color bar um, represents failure rate, so how often the original network fails to retrieve a memory. Notice that when we have no damage, the network is healthy and it has 0% failure rate until we get up into the 50% noise region. However, once we increase damage, once damage gets to 60 and 80 percent, the network fails to retrieve memories. However, the failure rate is decreased when we connect to the auxiliary network. So notice, as we increase connectivity here, at a given noise level, the failure rate decreases. And so the original network is able to better recover its memories when it has an auxiliary network helping it. Notice that the 400 neuron neural network is more effective at helping the original network than the 200 neuron network. Here are, here are the results for the non-optimal network. We see the same trends, higher connectivity to an auxiliary network, produces lower failure rates. Notice, however, that even when we have no damage, the network is not always able to retrieve its memories, but an auxiliary network helps it out. And so the auxiliary network is effective at helping the original network even when there is no damage. Here we're looking at network performance as we vary noise level. The blue lines represent zero connectivity to the auxiliary network. The red lines represent 25% connectivity to the auxiliary network. And the yellow lines represent 50% connectivity to the auxiliary network. The dotted lines are the optimal memory set, and the solid lines are the non-optimal memory set. Notice that as we increase the damage level, performance decreases for um, all of these settings. However, networks that are highly connected to an auxiliary network perform better than networks that are not connected to an auxiliary network. Um, this is more evident in the 400 neuron case than the 200 neuron case because the 400 neuron auxiliary network is more effective than its smaller counterpart. Um, these trends, however, only occur for lower noise levels. When our noise level increases to 40%, this trend shifts, and we see that the unconnected original network is actually performing better than the networks that have an auxiliary network connected to them. This is because at, ha at high noise levels, the auxiliary network isn't able to fully retrieve its auxiliary memory pattern and is therefore feeding incorrect information back to the original network, which um, hinders it rather than helping it. The results of this experiment show that a damaged memory network's performance can be increased by attaching an auxiliary network to it and allowing that to aid its memory recovery. Um, in the future, strategies like this could be used to counteract damage in the brain caused by traumatic brain injury or neurodegenerative disease. I'd like to thank Dr. Eric Chutler and Dr. Elise Johnson from the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering and Mel Melanie Weber for her valuable insight into the Hotfield Network. I did a lot of this research through an REU at the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Thank you for watching.